Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Susan Brewer Osorio, and on behalf of the faculty and staff at the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Arizona, I welcome you to today's Charla Con Café. I'm honored to introduce our invited speaker, Pedro Valenzuela. Pedro studied political science at Florida International University and comparative politics at the University of Pittsburgh, and he earned his PhD at Uppsala University in Sweden. He founded and directed the graduate program in conflict resolution at Haveriana University in Bogota, where he also directed the political science department and the human rights and peace building initiative. Today, Pedro will discuss the advances and setbacks in the Colombian peace process. Thank you, Pedro, for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Susan. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for this invitation to share with you a few thoughts on the situation in Colombia five years after the signing of the peace agreement with FARC. <clears throat> I'd like to start by, by telling you a little bit about our history of violence, but also of negotiations. Because it's very easy to, to think about Colombia only as a, conflict, as a country of violence. And it is true that we have had many, many violent conflicts through our history since we became independent in the early 19th century. We had several civil wars in the 19th century, and we had two major civil wars uh, at the beginning and in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and then, of course, as of the 1960s, we have had an internal armed conflict with leftist guerrillas and later on uh, with right-wing paramilitary groups and, and all kinds of uh, drug traffickers, etc. But uh, we also have a very long tradition of seeking negotiated solutions. So many of the wars uh, of the 19th century ended uh, through negotiations, uh, and certainly not only through negotiations, but also it, they ended up including the losing party in government. So they were power sharing uh, uh, arrangements uh, to bring these wars to an end. And uh, with the current guerrillas, the leftist guerrillas, we have been holding negotiations since the 1980s. Some of them very successful at the beginning of the 1990s, Several of the guerrilla groups demobilized in the 1990s. Uh, and then, of course, we have also had our share of failures in those terms. And particularly with FARC, that has been uh, complicated. Uh, so, uh, you know, with the FARC, our last efforts were in the 19, beginning, late 1990s and beginning of the 2000s. Unfortunately, that, of course, was not a successful peace process. So many more years of war uh, followed. And we were actually caught by surprise in August of 2012, when we learned that the government, the Colombian government, was holding secret negotiations or dialogues with FARC in Havana, Cuba. And of course, for the next four years, when the peace process was taking place, everything that was unfolding in Havana really captured our attention. So we were extremely happy let me, oh, I'm sorry, I, I see that I have, I'm not sharing the presentation. So I'm going, I'm going to do it really quick. So I was telling you that we were really surprised when, when we learned that there were secret negotiations. And then of course, for the next four years, the negotiations were taking place. So we were extremely happy to see this picture that you see in your screens. So you see on the left, President Santos of Colombia, in the center, uh, President Raul Castro of Cuba, and on the right, uh, you see FARC leader Timochenko. And that was to see these guys, you know, that had been at war for so long, uh, shaking hands, it, it really gave us a lot of hope for a more, much more peaceful uh, future. But perhaps the most shocking picture, or the one that really, that really created high expectations is this one. Because again, you see President Santos there, and you see Timochenko holding a baby in his arms, and that baby is the daughter of the woman you see to your right. And she is a park combatant that had uh, you know, given birth to this little girl. So that little girl represented you know, like a generation or the first generation that, are, that was going to, or, or had a real chance of growing up in a country at peace. So that really gave us a lot of hope and created many expectations. Unfortunately, things have not turned out the way that we expected. So, so achieving peace has been much more complicated than we thought it would be. Uh, 
I have been allotted 40 or 45 minutes to tell you what has happened since the signing of the agreement. So I thought that perhaps I'm going to concentrate in my talk on three main points. One is what has happened with the agreement. Specifically, I'm referring to uh, the, the state of the implementation of the peace agreement. The second one is going to be the, the persistent violence in the country and the effects that it's going to have for the potential consolidation of, of peace. And then if we have time, perhaps I'd like to talk about the third the aspect that nobody really talks much about it in Colombia, and that is the possibilities for reconciliation after such a protracted and destructive uh, war. So let me tell you a, a little bit about the peace agreement that you see there. It's a true peace agreement. And by that, I mean that it wasn't just a matter of uh, asking the FARC to turn in the guns uh, in exchange for some reintegration programs on the part of the Colombian government. Uh, so they really sat down and for four years negotiated really important points, not only for the FARC, but for the country as a whole. For instance, if you see the first, the first point, comprehensive rural reform, that is a recognition that Colombia is a very inequitable uh, country. Colombia is not a poor country. It's what uh, development agencies refer to as a middle-income country. But wealth in this country is incredibly uh, and fairly distributed. So we have huge class differences and the gap between the uh, urban areas and the countryside is huge. And the inequalities in the rural area are absolutely terrible. So this is a recognition that underlying this conflict, there is a problem in that sense and that we have to correct. And therefore what we are trying to do is to, to for instance, give land to those farmers that do not have access to land or to give land to those farmers that have just very few hectares of land, not enough to make their farms you know, productive. They, uh, it is an effort, I think, a true, an effort to make of these people that have been traditionally marginalized and excluded true citizens of the country. So it's a very important uh, point. The second one, political participation, also extremely important. And the reason is that, um, uh, you know, Colombia is, referred to normally as one of the longest standing democracies in the continent. And, and it is true that we have a, little, a liberal framework in place, but it is also true that our democracy is rather imperfect. And, and sometimes you really, when you refer to Colombia as a democracy, you really have to use an additional adjective. So you would say, for instance, it is a restricted democracy or it's a limited democracy or it's an illiberal democracy, all kinds of terms that people have, uh, authors have come up with. And this is what some author has called the, the anomaly of Colombia. You know, this very institutionalized liberal framework coexisting with very high levels of violence. Then the third point is, yeah, what are we gonna do with the FARC? How are they gonna turn in their guns? How are we going to reintegrate into society, uh, et cetera? The fourth point is also a recognition that the illicit drug economy is very much fueling the conflict, that everybody is getting engaged uh, with the, the drug trade in order to uh, well, either to enrich themselves or to get money to pursue the war, as in the case of the leftist guerrillas. Uh, victims, you know, the country, the, the conflict has been so protracted and so destructive that it has caused a lot of victims uh, in Colombia. Uh, between seven or eight million people have been forced to this have been displaced forcibly displaced they have been forced to abandon their land and the territories and not only have they lost uh, uh, the, the possibility of living in the territories they have also lost their properties so they have also been dispossessed on top of being displaced a lot of people have been sexually abused in this uh, conflict or forcibly recruited into the armed actors or, or kidnapped, you know, about 35,000 people were kidnapped. And that, of course, has a tremendous impact on, on the families. A, a lot of them were killed, more than 200,000. So the peace agreement, again, is a real agreement. It's not just a, an agreement to demobilize the guerrillas, but also to undertake transformations, structural tra transformations of the country that are badly needed. A, uh, so, the, the, uh, the peace agreement is extremely long. It's 320 pages. And uh, in addition to those six points that I just mentioned, 
every point has a lot of topics and subtopics, etc. So a total of 558 points were agreed between FARC and the government. In other words, they committed themselves to implementing 558 specific points, which of course we cannot discuss in this space and in this time. And of course, I also don't know what has happened exactly to 558 uh, commitments. Uh, so I cannot talk about each of them, but I will give you rather a broad idea of the trends that are happening in terms of uh, the implementation of the agreement. And I think that this slide that you see there gives you a very good idea. These are the six points and the state of implementation. I've taken this, of course, from the organizations that are in charge of moni monitoring the implementation of the agreement. Uh, the blue column gives you an idea of how many of those commitments in each of those points they have been uh, fully implemented. And uh, the gray column tells you that they have been minimally implemented. The yellow column tells you that they have not even begun to be implemented, etc. So the general idea that one gets by looking at these uh, slides and these graphs is that uh, you know a lot of these commitments that they have made they are minimally implemented or they have not even begun to be implemented with a few exceptions. For instance, the issue of the end of the conflict, which refers to the demobilization of the park uh, or the issue of verific, very, I'm sorry, monitoring and verification of the implementation. If we go, for instance, to the comprehensive rural reform, only about 4% have been fully implemented. And as I just told you, and this is one of the main points of the peace agreement because it really goes to the heart of the source of the conflict in Colombia, which is uh, inequality in that tenure and poverty in the rural areas. Uh, but very little of those dispositions have been implemented. So it gives you an idea then that uh, things are not evolving as uh, favorably as we expected after five years. There have been advances, there has been progress, but there's still a lot to be done. And if we don't do it quickly, that may have negative repercussions in terms of the real possibilities for consolidating peace. Now, there are several reasons for that. And one is, of course, that in the first two years after the agreements were signed, a lot of decisions had to be made. A lot of laws had to be approved in order to allow for the creation of institutions and for, you know, to give some norms in terms of uh, how the, the procedures were going to take place. Uh, it meant creating the whole, a whole bunch of infrastructure, hiring a lot of people uh, to implement the agreements, et cetera. So that certainly took some time. It's not something that could be achieved immediately. And then unfortunately the pandemic hit and uh, in Colombia, we had a very, a very serious uh, period of confinement. It was very long, we could not travel around the country. And that also had an impact on, on the implementation of many of the points of the agreement. The, the persistent violence in, in rural areas, and I will show you a little bit in a graph what is happening there, because it is in, the, in, the, in those areas that have specifically been identified as having priority for the implementation of the agreement that most of the violence today is taking place. Uh, and also we have to mention the, the lack of political will on the part of the government. You know, the governing party uh, really was very strongly oppo opposed to the peace negotiations uh, and to the peace agreement. You may know that the peace agreement was signed in October 2016, and I mean in September. Then in October, uh, the government, uh, you know, organized a referendum, which had, we had to say, yes, we approve the peace agreement or not. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and the governing party, the current government, really campaigned against it very, very strongly. And I may add, not very honestly, not in good faith. And the reason is that they really distorted the, the content of the agreement and scared a lot of people in Colombia as to the repercussions of signing this peace agreement would be very much based on a real distortion of the content of the agreement. So we lost, those of us who were in favor of the peace agreement, lost that referendum by a very small margin of less than 1%. But that also shows how divided the country became uh, in terms of the, of the peace agreement. And that, of course, also has an impact in the possibilities for peace. 
Then there is emphasis on the easy ones. By that I mean, because nothing is easy in the transition from war to peace. I simply mean that there are some, uh, some of the points that uh, the government was more interested in, in implementing. And that was, of course, securing the demobilization of the guerrillas and making sure that they turned in their weapons. So those, those have been advancing at, at a rather good pace, not without problems, and uh, as I will try to explain. And another factor that has impacted the, the slow pace of implementation is that there are all kinds of goals. You know, some of them can be achieved in the uh, short term, some of them in the very long term. Let me give you an example. One of the points of the, of the comprehensive rural agreement, rural reform, was uh, the creation of a land fund. A land fund meant that they were going, the government was going to purchase land or they were going to use public land in order to distribute to the poorest farmers in certain areas. Uh, and, and they have been doing so. As, as I say, there has been progress. But if they continue to implement that point at the pace that they are doing right now, by the time that the 12 years that they have given, been given to achieve that goal uh, are up, only about 21% of the people that were supposed to receive land will have received so. So we really need to pick up the pace of implementation. In terms of the easy points that have been, uh, you know, that real advances have been made, well, the demobilization of the FARC. The FARC demobilized about close to 9,000 combatants, a bit more, about 13,000 when you include other, other networks. Uh, and, uh, and they have turned in their guns. And I might add that when you make a comparison with other peace processes around the world, uh, you, you realize that normally the armed organizations do not turn in all their guns. Uh, the ratio of combatant, demobilized combatant to weapon that is turned in is not very, very high. In some countries, as low as 20% of a gun of a weapon per combatant, like in the case of Liberia or Sierra Leone. In the case of Colombia, with the right wing paramilitary groups, they turn in half a gun per every combatant. In the case of FARC, they really went over one. Uh, the ratio was one to one. In other words, one combatant and about one or 1.1 weapons that, that that combatant turn in. So that's a very successful, and that means that the FARC really is showing commitment uh, to the process. I'd like to show you what was done with the, with the weapons because I think it's very interesting and very symbolic and very important. In previous processes in Colombia, two things have been done with the weapons. Uh, one was that uh, they have been melted and in other cases, they have been thrown into the ocean. That, first that second option of throwing weapons into the water, of course, would be today unacceptable. That was in the late 1990s, early 19, late 1980s. Uh, but they did with the weapons turned in by FARC, which were around 9,000, uh, is that they melted them. And the idea, or what they, what they agreed to do was that three sculptures would be made out of those melted weapons. One in Bogota, one in New York, at the United Nations uh, Gardens, and one in Havana, in Cuba. Uh, so let me show you the, the first of that, those monuments. This is the monument in Bogota. It's been fully done, and I'd like to call your attention to two things that I find very interesting. One is that you see the ruins of a house. Uh, that house is, you know, the symbol of the destruction that can be caused by the war. That is not a, a house that was destroyed by the war, that this is the house that was in the lot where the, this monument was made, but it was in ruins. So they decided, or the artist, her name is Doris, uh, she decided to leave it like that as a symbol of the destruction of the war. But the most important aspect of this monument, I think, is the, uh, the floor. The floor is uh, the weapons of the park. You know, they melted these weapons, and a group of women who had been sexually abused during the war were in charge of, I don't know how to describe, they were hammering, you know, uh, the, the, the melted weapons in order to make sheets out of it. So there's 1,300 sheets that you see there uh, as the floor, uh, and those were the weapons of the park. And the, the symbolism is really interesting. The way she explains it is that 
This way, the relationship of power between weapons and us civilians has been reversed. During the war, she says, the, the weapons silenced us, the weapons killed us, the weapons dominated us and controlled us. And now that power relation has been reversed. Now we walk over the weapons and therefore it is us who has the power over the weapons. So I, I really like that, that symbolism. The second sculpture is that one that you see there. It was made out of the bullets that were, that were melted, tons of bullets. Uh, it was made by a Chilean artist who has lived in Colombia for, for a long time. And this is the one that is in New York. Uh, at, at first sight, it gives the impression that it is a bullet, but it isn't. If you look in, in, from a different angle, you will notice that it is a hollow, a hollow structure. So it, it is rather a canoe, not a bullet. And the way the artist explains this is that, uh, you know, in many parts of the country, uh, the rivers, particularly in the jungles, the rivers became real cemeteries. You know, the armed actors kill people and they throw the bodies into the river. So this is not a, a bullet as it looks, it is a canoe that is emerging out of the river, again, in a, another symbolism of that canoe, which is the main means of transportation in those areas of the country, it becomes overpowering, you know, all the, the what happened in terms of that. The third sculpture uh, has not been built, has been a lot of controversy is the one that is supposed to be in Havana. And I don't really know exactly the reasons for, for it not being, not being built. The FARC has been concentrated, the, 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 the fighters of the FARC have been concentrated in these 24 places, the, the colored dots, not the black dots. And uh, it's 24 places in various parts of the country, and not all of them are concentrated there. Uh, these were supposed to be transitory points when they, when they were integrated, but they have been made permanent now. And uh, there's a commitment on the government uh, to buy land and, and help with all kinds of productive projects. If you, if you attended the last talk organized by Susan, uh, the professor from Javeriana Cali gave us a very good idea in terms of the productive projects that are being there. There's a lot of problems there. I know Susan has visited a few of them and she is very much aware of the, of the, progress, of the problems that they, they are confronting. But I'd like to rescue that because I think the FARC has shown a, a good commitment really to, uh, to abide by this. And another aspect of the peace agreement that I'd like to rescue very briefly is this one. You know, the, uh, the, the comprehensive system for truth, justice, and reparations and non-recoveries. Uh, you see there that there are several components. One is the Truth Commission. That Truth Commission uh, has done, I think, a, a fantastic job uh, overcoming all kinds of obstacles. Uh, it's very well equipped. There's 11 commissioners, one of them a foreigner uh, from Spain, from the Basque country in Spain. The other ones are very representative of Colombian society. Uh, many, uh, the gender balance is very important. Indigenous people, Afro-Colombian people, LGBTI community. So very representative of, of civil society. And they are about to uh, publish their report. I think it's in November of this year that they have to make it, make it public. We are hoping that it will be, you know, an account that a legitimized account of what happened during during the years of the conflict. Uh, then there is a unit in, in, in charge of searching for people who are presumed disappeared, and the estimates of people who were disappeared in this war are extremely high, much more than the people who disappeared in the dictatorships of the Southern Cone in the 1970s and 80s. So it's important that I don't know exactly how, if, whether they, they'll be able to perform their job or not. And the special jurisdiction for peace, that's the, the, the court or the tribunal that is in charge of, of uh, dealing with transitional justice. Uh, and, and of course, it has been extremely controversial because of the type of sentences that they can impose on the park. Uh, perhaps I have time to tell you a little, a little bit about that. But basically they are concentrating on what they call macro cases and it has to do with kidnapping, extrajudicial executions on the part of the army, the, um, the recruitment of minors, the, um, the extermination of a political party that was created by the park in the 1980s. So that's, that's been, you know, I think an important development, very much criticized by, by sectors that are not 
uh, in favor of the peace agreement. Then the security issue, very briefly, I'd like to give an idea of what, is, what is, has been happening there. And, uh, you know, one, one problem is that, that we have to keep in mind is that, unlike other Latin American countries that made the transition from war to peace, like uh, Guatemala or El Salvador, the Colombian rebels have never been able to unite themselves, coalesced around a, a common political and military project. Uh, so therefore, uh, all the peace agreements that we have signed in the past with guerrilla movements have been individual peace agreements. In other words, we have had what we call here a partial peace or partial pieces in plural. Uh, and this is no exception. Admittedly, we just signed a peace agreement with the largest of the guerrilla groups, with the most uh, um, uh, capable in military terms, but still only one, one group. So that means that other groups are still in the conflict. Other leftist organizations like the ELN, for instance, which is as old as the FARC in the war, and there are uh, dissident groups from the FARC that never signed the peace agreement. A, a part of the FARC that signed the peace agreement but decided to go back uh, to the armed struggle. We have a whole bunch of neo-paramilitary groups, and we have a whole bunch of drug-related or drug trafficking-related organizations. So there's a lot of of actors of violence that are still, you know, engaged in violence, uh, giving rise to what we have called here zones of indefinition or hybrid areas or areas of violent peace, etc. Uh, so that's why violence is persistent, but that doesn't mean that there are not great progress in these areas. And let me show you one example of what I mean. These are deaths related to the armed conflict in Colombia from the moment where the conflict escalated in the 1980s to all the way to 2019, I think it is. Uh, and then, so that gives you an idea that there is a significant improvement in terms of homicides related to, to the armed conflict that began way before the peace process began. But still, if you see the amount, the, the worst year was 2002 with more than 24,000 uh, homicides or deaths related to the armed conflict. And, uh, and then when the peace process began, uh, there had been a, a significant reduction in terms of, of deaths related to the conflict, but it was still almost close to 2,000 per year, 1,900 and something. And today, and the last uh, number that I have there is about 400. So it is a very significant reduction after the peace agreement was signed, continuing the trend that was coming from the previous years. Now, I don't have data here for the last two years, and unfortunately, that number has gone up, but nothing, nothing to the level of what it used to be before, before the peace agreement was signed. And one of the great problems for, civil, for civilians here was uh, the, uh, the issue of displacement, as I told you. And if you look uh, at the year 2012, when the process of negotiations with the FARC began, what you see is that the figures just plummeted after the beginning of the of the peace of the peace negotiations. And today, again, in the last couple of years, the trend is up, but really far, far, far from what it used to be before negotiations started. So there, there has been there have been changes in the country. That is something that we cannot deny. Uh, and but I like to to point out this. Uh, the uh, the municipalities that are at peace are the ones that you see in blue. In other words, the country has 1,123 municipalities. And as you can see, really more than 800 and even close to uh, 900 in 2020 are uh, countries, I mean, are municipalities that are not experiencing violence. Uh, so again, we cannot say that, uh, that there has not been progress. Indeed, there has been. But there is one significant problem, and that is that this, uh, the, the, the wave of violence that we are experiencing is um, affecting very significantly specific sectors of society and very important sectors of society. So that's the case, for instance, of the murder of social leaders. And as you can see, you know, there has been an increase in the numbers of, of, of attacks or of murders, really, against social leaders, not to mention 
um, threats and not to mention uh, you know being forced to to leave the ter to be displaced etc cetera, etc cetera. <clears throat> so it is significant and it's a trend that is extremely worrisome and that we really have to pay attention to uh, and there is also so they are limited to a few about what 10 15 percent of the municipalities of the country but again unfortunately are the ones that correspond precisely with those areas that have been identified as uh, uh, having priority in terms of the implementation. So most of these leaders were uh, in one way or, or another engaged with issues that are related to the implementation of the peace agreement. So <clears throat> that is, of course, uh, again, a very worrisome trend in terms of what, what the consequences for the, the peace agreement. Uh, the departments, as you can see, are also some of them they occupy a very important place in terms of, of repression uh, and against the, the social leaders. Uh, um, and uh, again, this is a very worrisome trend and, and that can have very significant consequences for, for peace agreement. Uh, again, this shows you the areas that have been prioritized uh, for the implementation of the agreement. In Colombia, we call them PEDETs. Uh, and you can see that the homicide rates are much higher there than in the rest of society. So <clears throat> it's like these areas are the ones that are being mostly targeted, more mostly targeted with all the consequences that it that might have. In addition, uh, the demobilized combatants are also being targeted. And I give you there are some numbers. Uh, uh, close to 300 of them uh, have been have been murdered already. So and again with very dramatic consequences. Uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, now, there are several explanations of why the attack specifically the social leaders. I'd like to rescue these, these, uh, these factors that have been identified by empirical studies. Uh, there is a coincidence. A, a recent study made by Jeronimo Rios it shows that uh, most of them take place in, in, in places uh, where there are a coincidence of illegal economies and presence of non state armed groups normally in very marginal areas of the country or peripheral, peripheral as, as he calls them, but uh, where there is also very authoritarian local politics. Let, let me <clears throat> elaborate a little on what I mean by that. When we say that these are peripheral areas and that uh, there is a very weak presence of the state, we don't mean that there is a lack of, of social order. We know that these uh, armed actors impose local orders, some of them extremely authoritarian, and therefore, it seems that what is at stake here is that many of the mechanisms that have been introduced by the peace agreement may really imply a challenge to that local social order. So it's not only that the, that the for instance, the drug traffickers feel that, uh, that the social leaders are an impediment uh, to their business, which are in many ways, they, uh, or that they are you know, um, advocating uh, substitution, the crop substitution, you know, from coca to legitimate or legal legal products, is that they also may be challenging those social and local orders that are have been established in a very authoritarian way. So they do feel that they are a threat, let's say, to those local orders. So we might see, and particularly now that elections are coming, we might see an increase in the in the targeting of social leaders or opposition, particularly leftist forces. That we have seen very much a case in the in the in the past. One of the patterns, because you know the the destruction of that political party that the FARC created many years ago in the 80s, really, it never really was very powerful at the national level, but it it really created a, or constituted a local threats, a local I mean threats to local orders, and that's where they were mostly persecuted and exterminated. So there might be a danger that, that alternative political forces that emerge to challenge these local orders will be increasingly targeted as well. Uh, but there is also the case, we cannot deny that there is a trend towards an increase uh, in, uh, in areas that are, you know, with coca uh, plantations. And one really big problem I think is that at least half of them are in protected areas like natural reserves, natural parks, national parks. Uh, in indigenous, uh, about 20, about 20 percent of what we call here resguardos, which would be something similar uh, to what you call reservations in the United States, 
uh, are, are, are being affected by this type of, of economies and about 50% of the Afro-Colombian councils are being affected by them as well. Uh, and I, I have a few minutes in, and I'd like to at least give you a very brief idea as to how complicated this process of reconciliation will be. One of the things is very, very curious phenomenon is that many Colombians in abstract uh, support the, the negotiated solution. And they did so throughout President Uribe's administrations. His eight years of government, public opinion polls showed that Colombians preferred a negotiated solution to a military solution. So in abstract, we all support peace. But when it comes down to it, and we see this, the, the things that have been specifically agreed to in peace agreements, the, 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 the story is completely different. And you see that the support now for the specific peace agreement that was reached with the FARC drops dramatically. So in abstract, we are not for peace. Uh, when it comes to the peace agreement, there's a lot of opposition to it. It's a very, very divided country uh, in terms of, 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 of those issues. Uh, very briefly, uh, they do support some elements of the peace agreement. For instance, the issue of agrarian reform. Uh, but when it comes to equality of parties, by that I mean, the, the question that was asked is whether the government should finance the FARC party, whether the FARC party should be uh, have access to uh, the means of communication to the media, uh, you know, whether they should compete in local elections, the story is completely different. So there's a lot of rejection to that. And that, of course, that is going to have a... Um, repercussions in terms of the consolidation of democracy and the possibilities of the peace agreement. Uh, let me give you an idea. A lot of people in abstract, half of them uh, in 2018, think that reconciliation with the FARC is possible. That's not a very encouraging uh, number, of course. It's very low. Just half the country thinks that we, that we can reconciliate with the FARC. Uh, and they agree that some of these measures could lead to reconciliation, for instance, a compensation from the state, compensation by the perpetrators, the truth, etc. If the perpetrators ask for forgiveness, all these are steps that might lead in the direction of reconciliation. In terms of day-to-day -day coexistence with former combatants, well, it's not very encouraging. As you can see, they, they are very, or we are, very reluctant to allow our children to, to become friends with the children of uh, uh, oh no, with ex-combatants or, uh, you know, attending school with ex-combatants or working with ex-combatants, the percentages are not very high. Perhaps the highest is whether they could live in our own neighborhoods, you know, but that, that doesn't imply a very direct contact. Uh, the trust in FARC has increased a little bit. It's very low, as you can see, but it has increased. And I think it has to do a lot with uh, Certain actions that FARC has undertaken, like you know, the commitment to demobilize, to uh, to to keep themselves within the parameters of the peace agreement, despite all the difficulties. They, um, uh, and this is, I like to to close down three minutes. I need for this, I suppose, support for the political system. Again, in abstract, we are very democratic, you know. So we all think that democracy is the best thing ever. And that's the the blue column. But uh, that when it comes to the Colombian system, we are a bit disappointed. You know, we don't think the, uh, the system works very well. And as you can see, in some years, even 30%, less than 30% agree that the Colombian system uh, works very well. So it's, in fact, we're dealing with a very illegitimate regime in many, many ways, and with many legitimate institutions, you know. I think the one that is higher at the moment in terms of trust of the people, I think it's the church. Sometimes one wonders why, but sometimes one can understand why. Uh, this is terrible. They haven't asked this question anymore, and it is a shame uh, because I, I thought it was extremely worrisome. You know, when they when they ask people, uh, ask Colombians, uh, uh, if people who are in opposition have the right to be elected, only forty percent said yes. Uh, only 44%, yes, they should have the freedom of uh, the right to express themselves. Only 40% said, 47 said they have the right to vote. And only 50% said that, that they had the right to engage in peaceful demonstrations. 
So the co political culture of the country is not very conducive you know, to the consolidation of democracy and to the consolidation of peace, because really big part of the process is to convince those who are in the armed struggle that it is worth you know, participating in politics through institutional channels. And they won't find a very, a very encouraging type of uh, you know, environment for that. So people think very, very bad of, of opposition forces. We do not see opposition as a legitimate uh, stance in democratic uh, countries, but we see them as true enemies. And therefore, again, this is not very encouraging. So with that, I, I finish, uh, Susan. I think I did it within the limit. You know, you so, yes, right. and it was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, we have time to open up to um, questions. Um, so there are 55 people and I kind of have to look around, but if you want to raise <coughs> your Zoom hand or just put it in the chat and I'll try to um, move around and take questions. Marcela? Okay, I have a question. Muchas gracias, Pedro. Very um, clear and interesting. I'm Marcela Vasquez. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American Studies. And I'm very glad you're here with us. I am a fellow Colombian and I have a, a lot of questions, but I'm not gonna ask them all. I think my, my main question or, or one of the things that I keep on thinking about, I was in, in La Guajira like before the pandemic, right before. And one of the things that was very clear there is that there, the, uh, there was a void left by the FARC mm -hmm. and the military was basically running everything. And I was with some of the indigenous communities with the YU and say, I was in several places, but the common complaint was that the military had no restraint and they were raping girls as they went to school. So they felt that they had lost a level of protection. And I've heard that in other parts of the country. So I wanted you to say something about that. Yeah, I think you're right in the sense that um, the FARC left a terrible void and the government and the state was warned that what, that was gonna happen and that therefore they should take the preventive measures you know, to avoid the other groups from taking over. The problem is, as you mentioned, uh, that uh, in that case, that you specific case that you're mentioning, well, that void was filled by the state, as we all were claiming them to, uh, asking them to do. But obviously, uh, we were dealing with an institution that has shown the, uh, itself to be very corrupted in some in some uh, parts of the country. I don't doubt that there are military, the Colombian military, that have military honor. In fact, we know some of them. Uh, but we also know that uh, sectors of that, that uh, institution have been very much engaged in all kinds of, of uh, human rights violations and violations of international humanitarian law. So it's not just a matter of sending the, the state there because the state might come in the capacity that you are mentioning and that of course will not solve the problem. Uh, I think that, you know, and the communities might fill the void in the sense that in some parts where the rebels uh, both of the right and the left were able to establish a much more cooperative mm -hmm. relationship with communities. In some others, they were viewed as an occupation army, but in some, they really created, uh, you know, good relations with the community. In the case of FARC, for instance, uh, to me, the clearest case is Nauri, and in La Vive Meta, I mean, mm -hmm. and that's why they got such a, a significant support in electoral uh, terms. They did not do very well in every place where they were strong during the war. For instance, uh, San Vicente del Cahuan, they were like fifth, and uh, they did well in, in Meta and they did well in Toribio. Uh, so yes, it depends very much on what type of relations the armed group established with the communities. They are gonna fill the void much more, especially if the one, if the one actor that replaces what is, who used to be there before comes in that, uh, with that uh, strategy that you are mentioning, of course, it's, it's terrible. And that, that is, we just saw very recently as well in the newspapers that they have found out that this general, I don't remember his name, was very much involved in drug trafficking with uh, other former military and current military people. So yeah, it's an institution that is badly in need of, of reform and uh, to, you know, to, to comply with the role that they are about, uh, 
that they are asked to perform by the constitution and the law. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's why, uh, Marcela, I may add, you know, some of them are actually accepting to go in front of the of the hip, while others are very reluctant to do so. So they they are also there are also sectors of that institution that are admitting uh, what we all know happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can open it up to more questions. I can do a follow up. Oh, oh one Noah has a question. <laughs> yes. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, what is your take on um, Senator uh, Gustavo Petro's rise in the polls in the upcoming Colombian elections? And do you think um, that there is going to be opposition from the American state to his uh, election campaign? <clears throat> I hope not. One of the things that uh, that was rather encouraging, really, in terms of uh, the American administration regarding the peace process is that they were uh, not uh, opposed to it. Uh, and sometimes when the United States remains quiet, that's a very good sign. Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes we prefer them not to say much, uh, because sometimes when they speak, they really scare us. Uh, and the fact that they, they did not oppose openly the, the peace process and in fact gave signs that they supported it was very encouraging. So if they are going to be, uh, we say consequent in Spanish, I have no idea how to say in English, coherent, if they are going to be coherent with their position, of course they should understand that, uh, that this is part precisely of this democratic opening that we are hoping for in the country. I, uh, I, I see that is very understandable, the, the political phenomenon that he has created, because of course there's a lot of frustration, as I mentioned, with the traditional political class. And, uh, and he belongs to a group that was in arms many, many years ago, and that has uh, proven to, to be completely abiding by the commitments that they made back then. Uh, and he is not really advancing a very radical, project if you if you if you think about it uh, but it is a project that captures the discontent of large segments of Colombians. I don't know if he's going to win the elections or not uh, because there are still possibilities that he will not even though he's leading uh, in the polls but uh, so I don't know I, I'm all, all I hope is that he is able to to campaign in a, in a in a climate of peace and democracy because this is what it's all about. I, I, and, and again, I don't think his, his project is very radical, but uh, it threatens a lot of sectors, of course, and they will keep playing with the threat of communism and um, you know, Cuba and, and Venezuela and well, all kinds of threats that are not really, not really very serious at all. So I hope he makes it alive, you know, which in this country, uh, when you come from a tradition of the left, it's, uh, it's no, no mean achievement. Liz, did you have a question? Um, yeah, thank you uh, for such an informative and, and clear talk. My question is about the Truth Commission. Um, and I'll just mention, um, Susan, Marcella, and I were collaborating uh, with the Truth Commission uh, here in the US in their um, effort to collect testimony from, from exiles and Colombians outside the country. So um, my question is, if you could say a little bit more about the social energy that you see uh, around the Truth Commission and around the Truth Commission report, because of course, um, you know, one can anticipate the report will, will be attacked and questioned from various sides. Um, and, you know, thinking broadly about these experiences in Latin America, it can be important. Um, a Truth Commission report can um, uh, um, have an important uh, effect on broader peace uh, uh, efforts. And so I'm wondering kind of what kind of energy you see uh, in Colombia around the Truth Commission experience, you know, what will happen after it's over in terms of the life of the report, do you think? You know, I think, uh, I think you have, you're completely right in terms that it will be extremely controversial. Mm -hmm. This is a country that is very, very divided along these lines, anything that has to do with the peace agreement, anything that has to do with uh, the truth, of course, will be contested forever, I think. And that is that is going to be a shame 
but it is also part of uh, finding the truth. I don't, I don't think that we can give, I mean, I think we can give a type of truth that perhaps we all can accept uh, in terms of documenting, for instance, what happened and what were the main, uh, you know, the main patterns of, of abuses, et cetera, and even responsibilities. I don't think that we will reach what uh, some people have called social truth. I think that will take many generations and we will continue to be contested for a very, very long time, especially because again, as I say, it's, it's, you know, it's gonna find a country that is very, very divided along, along these issues. And that the attacks on the Truth Commission and the whole system of transitional justice has been, have been extremely, extremely harsh and will continue to be so. And it's, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that, uh, I think, at least we can hope for a measure of acknowledgement because the knowledge I think we already have, Colombia doesn't start finding the truth from zero. You know, we have been documenting it for, for decades and not only because this is a very funny state, you know, it's not a very uh, cohesive state, it's very divided. So even from reports that come from the state, uh, we know that the state have been uh, committing uh, serious abuses. So at least it's, it will be a matter of uh, acknowledgement of something that perhaps we already have an idea of what happened. But I really think it won't be easy. I think uh, it's going to be very, very controversial. Uh, I don't know exactly what they are planning in terms of uh, making the report know, known. Uh, there are many strategies that could lead us in a in the direction of uh, you know educating about the, the report, I hope they do because otherwise we may have we may meet the same fate of the of the peace agreement you know when there was so little education as to the general agreements. So yeah, I think uh, you're right in the sense that the, this I don't remember the expression you used the social climate. I think uh, not very it's not going to be very conducive to an acceptance simply of the report. It will be very contested. Thank you. We have a question in the chat from George Rivas and George asks, um, he says, I noticed in one of the charts that conflict homicides peaked around the year 2002. Was this related at all to George Bush's declaration of war on terror? And did the American military play any role in the Colombian FARC conflict? Uh, no, I think that the 2002 peak had to do with internal conditions and that is the year when President Pastrana decided to put an end to the peace negotiations with, with the FARC. And they had, you know, for, for, that, for that peace process, they had demilitarized an area, a large area, 42,000 square kilometers, which is twice the size of a country like El Salvador, for instance. Uh, and then when he decided that uh, the process, the peace process would no, no longer be taking place, he gave the army the order of risk recovering that, that area. And of course, the combats in that area were extremely, extremely heavy in all the areas controlled by FARC. So, so yeah, I think it has more, more to do with internal conditions than with the war on terror, even though, of course, the war on terror had, had repercussions in Colombia as well. And the role of the US military, yes, well, they have been here since the very old violencia. Uh, they have been involved in the Colombian conflict since the very old violencia in more than one ways. They are obviously in the in the training of military, like they did with all the Latin American military, and you know they remember the, the school of the Americas that still caused terror when we hear that that word because of the type of training that they were giving the Latin American military there. They are, so they, they have been involved in the counterinsurgency efforts since since forever. You know since the moment when when the FARC was bombed in 1964 and on. Uh, military assistance, of course, intelligence gathering, the modernization of the armed forces since, uh, particularly since, since Plan Colombia in, in early 2000, uh, you know, the creation of mobile brigades, uh, the increased capability in terms of intelligence gathering, uh, night combat the capabilities, so on, very much involved in those, in those terms, very much in support, of course, of the Colombian army. I have, um, if I can, I wanna make sure I'm not jumping in in front of anyone. I don't see any other hands. I have a kind of related question. Um, I was you know, kind of keeping my eye on developments with the Biden administration. And I noticed at the end of last year that Biden had moved to move the FARC off of the US's list of
Or process and implementation, this is anyway going to benefit um, ex combatants. One would expect so. Compliance. Again, because, because Obama really gave support to the peace process. Uh, and, and for instance, one of the things that some people have really um, highlighted in terms of uh, a potential positive impact is uh, the, uh, the way that the United States is now defining the strategies against drugs. And um, people feel that that might have a, a positive repercussion in terms of encouraging alternatives to the traditional method that we have been following. Very much, of course, encouraged by the, or, or, or demanded by the United States, which is the, uh, the fumigation with very dangerous chemicals and, uh, and the military solution. So there are, there are hopeful signals that we hope that they will actually materialize in that direction. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question from, from David Blanco. Okay, so thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just have like two small questions. The first one, what's what's going to be like the future of this piece of, of this peace um, treat uh, agreement, particularly that other uh, armed groups like the um, ELN, <laughs> They didn't make part of these conversations or of this agreement and we still have these groups that's one question and the other one is i really don't know if there's only a other agreement in the world like this one where the leaders who violate uh human rights did kidnappings drug trafficking um all these kind of uh, felonies, and they are now in the Congress without being in jail at least once. You know, it's like a message for the Colombian people. Look, doing felonies do really pay off in the long term. You know, so that's all like my two questions. Thank you. Mm. Well, both are very complicated to answer. Uh, let me let me take care an effort to answer the first. Yes, as I mentioned, there are many, many actors that are still engaged in, in violence. And I, I mentioned that they are, they constitute a real threat to the implementation of the peace agreement. You will find, of course, in Colombia, many positions regarding that. Those that say, well, we have to, uh, you know, try to militarily defeat these organizations as we have done for the past 60 years without really much success. Or do we engage them in peace negotiations as we did with the FARC? So there is a very strong movement that argues yeah, we should, I mean, peace in Colombia will be incomplete unless other organizations, particularly they are referring to the year then, uh, engage in the, in the peace process. Uh, so, but you're right. I mean, as long as they continue existing, the, the whole future of peace in Colombia is put at, um, you know, in, in danger. Uh, now, not to the extent that it used to be before, and I think many authors have pointed out how this is a really more localized type of conflict than a real effort at the national level as the FARC was able to do. That's a, a difference with the, with the previous confrontation. But we don't know if they can evolve into something much bigger than they are now. Uh, hopefully not, because then, again, we would be recreating the conditions for a long conflict as before. The second one, uh, yeah, many, many, that's what transitional justice is about. Uh, in the sense that I don't know if exactly they're rep being represented in Congress without, without going to, uh, to serve a prison sentence. I really would have to check, uh, to check that information because I'm not sure. But of course, all transitional processes, when the issue has not been resolved in, in the military field, imply some sort of transaction with the rebel organization that is going to make the transition. There are very few cases where the negotiations don't lead uh, to this type of concessions. For instance, if you look at what happened in Chile, in Chile, the concession was to allow a criminal like Pinochet to be in Congress for the rest of his life. And that must have been really a slap on the face of, uh, of the victims of the, of the regime. But he was in Congress until the rest of, of, of his life, for the rest of his life. The only attempt to really try him was by a foreign judge that uh, only meant that he lived in a mansion in England for about a year or so. 
Uh, but yes, uh, transitional justice is transactional justice. You know, that's that's the bottom line. And of course, you may agree on several on several measures. And of course, I'm not saying it's an easy decision. It's a decision that has very profound ethical and political considerations and dilemmas. And the, the dilemma is, do we accept to make concessions like the ones that you were mentioning, uh, or do we continue the war for another six years and causing more victims towards the future? Those are not easy dilemmas to resolve. Uh, I will check my information on whether on the part of rebel movements, this has been the case without alternative sentences. Uh, I have a feeling that I will find cases where that is the case, but I just gave you an example of where criminals, war criminals, have ended up in Congress forever, like the case of Pinochet. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think that that would be my answer. Thank you so much, Pedro. We have to um, close it out. We're at 2.05. If there are um, any additional questions, um, you can email them to me. Maybe I can um, ask Pedro if I can put you in touch so we don't have to stop the conversation here if you want to keep talking. Um, we really thank you for your time. That was really excellent and informative. Um, so thank you so much. And everyone have a great Friday and, and a wonderful weekend. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye, Pedro.